morning. Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to make your way in and grab a seat, if I can have the rest of my uh, team up here, please. Come on, kids, out the back. It's time to come in for church. Now, there are no mask mandates for the church, but obviously if you need to wear one because you've been in a contract, uh, one of the tracing places or from, for some other reason, you're more than welcome to do so. But um, just to let you know there's no mask mandates for here at the moment. Well, good morning and welcome. Before we start, I'm just going to read from Psalm 89. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. Let's stand and sing. so so freely lord we come here we want to lift up your name we praise you we give you all the glory and all the honor 
for the many great and wonderful things that you have done for us. Lord, we just want to focus this morning and lift up our praise to you in your mighty name. Amen. Thank you. 
again welcome this morning to the Mount Isa Baptist Church. If you're uh, visiting with us, it's great to have you with us. And um, at the end of the service, please stay around for a cup of tea or coffee. Um, it's not hard to tell it's uh, school holidays time with uh, things being very uh, light on. But uh, we're used to that. Um, just a few announcements. Um, we've got the yard work, so we're just still looking for a few volunteers who can help out during... Um, December and January. Um, if you want to know some more about that, just ask or chat to um, Pastor Tim. Christmas lunch. If you're in town and you haven't got anything else organised, please feel free to um, join us here for Christmas lunch. But just need to, um, you can log on and just uh, register for that. And again, if you need any help with that, um, probably ask Pastor Tim. He can point you in the right directions. Um, other volunteers with needing to just for greeters and sunshine corner leaders for next year and um, we'll probably and as usual we'll probably be looking for um, uh, brigade leaders to help out where we can so um, if, if you're looking for something to do or just like to think about where you might be able to help and assist in that um, just other few couple of housekeeping things with the um, kids you'll notice at the back there's a our new big sign that we've um, got that will be getting put out the front of the church later on but for now it's sitting out on the table so just please kids stay away from that um, don't go playing with it and also at the end of the service just ask um, the kids not to be running in and around through these doors and chasing each other at breakneck speed because um, someone at some time someone's going to get hurt we've got adults with hot cups of co tea and coffee uh, so please do not run in and around through here someone will get hurt and we don't like that. It's too much paperwork. Um, if we've got a, our stewards who could um, take up the offering for us this if at this time, if you could um, do that for us, thanks. If you're visiting and haven't come prepared for that, please feel free to just let the bag pass you by. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the many great gifts that you give to us. And Lord, we just pray as we just bring back a small portion of that that you've given to us, Lord, here this morning. Lord, we pray that, um, Lord, it will be used wisely within the church, Lord, as we seek to promote your kingdom here in this community. Lord, we pray that your blessings upon this. If you'd like to open your Bible, now did we have... Emma, were you reading? We didn't have anyone for Bible reading, so yep, I shall do that. So if you'd like, up to, like to open up to Matthew chapter 2. And we'll be starting from verse 13. So Matthew 2, verse starting at verse 13 through to verse 23. Now when they had departed, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child and to destroy him. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, 
and remain there until the death of Herod. And this was a f- and this was to f- fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years older or two years old or under according to the time of when he ascertained from the wise men then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah a voice was heard in Ramah weeping and loud lamentation Rachel weeping for her children she refused to be comforted because they were no more but then, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called that Nazarene. Um, We're going to have a time of communion, and I'd like to ask Bob to come and take that. Thanks, Gary. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Uh, Could the stewards come forward and collect the elements, please? Distribute them. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now in the two commandments, we have three people identified. We have God, we have neighbour and we have self. Conspicuous by their absence is a group of people that tend to be very important to many Christians and in many Christian congregations. And uh, that group of people is family. Uh, For example, uh, during my time in uh, Christianity, uh, there's been numerous opportunities uh, over the years to attend seminars on marriage and to do courses such as Growing uh, Kids God's Way. Um, which have been presented. Um, In comparison, however, I've never heard of a course offered or a seminar offered on loving your neighbour as you love yourself. Now, given that loving family is um, in many um, households, certainly in mine, more of a priority than loving neighbour, this begs the question, well, why isn't loving family actually specifically mentioned in the two most important commands? And I'd just like to share a couple of thoughts on that this morning. The first thought is that when it comes to these three priorities, loving God, loving neighbour and loving family, by far the most natural inclination of many people is of course to love family. Um, Right throughout the world, throughout many societies, family is incredibly important. And so when it comes to these three priorities, uh, in a sense, loving family is a priority that doesn't need to be stated as much as loving God and loving neighbour needs to be stated. The uh, second thing is that um, I would suggest that we can find family in the second most important command. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. It's uh, quite common in uh, in many cultures, in many families, for people to very much identify with their family. For example, in my own family, I can look at major decisions that I have made in life, which if I had been a single person, those decisions would have been significantly different. So I would suggest that um, family 
can be uh, found in the second most important command. We could actually understand that command as love your neighbour as you love yourself and your family. This morning, as we come and we remember what God did with his own family, Jesus Christ, his son, for the benefit of people who were not his family, I would ask this morning that we take some time to prayerfully ask the question, Lord, how am I doing balancing these three priorities? Loving God, loving family, and loving neighbour. When it comes to loving family, I, uh, I suggest we break that up into two components. Component number one is the righteous component, the love for our family that we absolutely need to give them, um, especially us parents, because we brought these kids into the world. It's our responsibility to look after them. But the second component, which many of us have a bit of a problem with, I suggest, is the indulgent component. Um, I don't know about you, but I do like to give my kids things that, deep down in my heart, I, I really know that they do not need to have. And um, I find this tussle at times between doing things for my family that are of an indulgent nature, even though I know by doing so, well, there's money that's going to be spent on them that can't be spent on other families whose children are starving. So let's take a moment now to pray, to ask God to convict us in this area, to ask, are there ways that we can improve in the way that we're managing our lives that enable us to get this balance between loving God, loving neighbour and loving family right? Let's quietly pray and then I'll lead you in eating the bread and uh, drinking the wine. Let's eat the bread together, which reminds us that Jesus Christ's body was both broken to meet our needs. Let's drink the wine, which symbolizes the blood that Jesus Christ shed that we might be have our sins washed from us. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord, for sacrificing your family that we might be forgiven for our sin and that we may become members of your family. A phenomenal gift. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Please help each of us, Lord, to get these three priorities, loving you, loving neighbour, and loving family in a more godly balance according to our individual circumstances which you intimately know. Amen. Now, we don't have a um, kid spot this week, so if I could get the rest of the team back up. Just while the cups are being collected, we'll uh, stay seated while we sing this song.
Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here. We trust that the service is helpful for your life and faith. Now, yesterday, a few of us were able to go out caroling and uh, spread some Christmas cheer, particularly with things certainly changed uh, in our society at the moment. It was good to provide, uh, sing songs that Christ is King. And uh, we had a few people talk to us and lots of smiles and things and made our way from Kmart to the Coles entrance and then up to one of the cafes. So we had a wonderful time. Uh, and there are still some Bibles um, on the front table. So if you haven't considered, you know, uh, what you might do for personal outreach uh, in the lead up for Christmas, uh, my girls and I, we went for a walk uh, during the week and put a bunch of Bibles in people's letterboxes. So not uh, too hard to do if you considering something of, of how you might uh, reach out to your neighbours. Uh, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your holy, inerrant and life-giving word. We thank, that you, we thank you that you have come in fulfilment of scripture, that you succeeded where the nation of Israel failed and that you are the Messiah, the one in whom the promises of the Old Testament are fulfilled. May we kiss the sun lest we perish in the way. Amen. Well, I've been doing a significant amount of uh, reading in Baptist church history. And one of the most significant figures after the original English Baptist, that of John Smith and Thomas Ellis, was a man by the name of Roger Williams. Uh, he was originally born around, in, somewhere around London around 1599 and quickly took a liking to theology. Uh, but the restrictiveness that he found in the, the State Church of England meant that he couldn't worship according to his convictions. Uh, so he left for America. Uh, the first pilgrims had already arrived in America on the Mayflower and settled in Plymouth. And Roger Williams left for New England shortly after that. That is, well, New England being America. Uh, in 1630, he arrived in Massachusetts and then moving on to Boston, where he became known for having some dangerous ideas. And he finally settled in Salem and received a call to pastor the church there. But even from Salem, he managed in good Baptist style to agitate the Boston colony some 40 kilometres away. His crimes included the idea that people had no faith, shouldn't be required to take a religious oath, that the magistrate shouldn't meddle in religious affairs, um, those affairs that relate to our duty to God. And finally, the colonists shouldn't simply take the land of the native Indians, but they should pay for it. And for these dangerous ideas, Williams was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the different biographies describe his journey. He pierced the woods in the middle of winter. One of them reads, Into those wild tracks of nature where the wolf, the bear and the panther roamed in all their veracity. Aside from this, with their fishing game, they had little food, in the depth of winter, knowing nothing of salted meats, and often they were sorely pinched with hunger. So far as appears, Williams entered the desert without a weapon, a bow or arrow, spear or club, hatchet or gun, to hunt for bird or beast, and every, everything was frozen. And Roger Williams would go on to found Rhode Island, a colony where Williams and his, uh, his associates could live according to their conviction, and in fact, the place where we have religious freedoms, as we understand today. Uh, came from Roger Williams. And the point I want to make here is that have you ever considered what it's like, like Roger Williams in that story, of, of having to flee your home? Uh, reading the, the stories of Roger Williams certainly sparked my imagination of uh, being forced to enter the woods, not knowing where you're going in the middle of winter, or how you will survive, or where you will end up. No security, uh, being surrounded by constant danger, not knowing where the next meal will come from, needing to flee your home is not a pressing issue in Australia. It certainly has been currently and uh, throughout the ages, people fleeing uh, war-torn countries and nations. Uh, certainly a common practice for Christians and Baptists, fleeing from religious persecution. In the passage before us, we see that our precious Saviour, and his family were put in that position of outcasts, of having to flee from their home and into an unknown future. And Joseph, uh, the father, earthly father of Jesus, um, he was responsible. And uh, we see that, that he trusted the word of God that he received through an angel to guide him to where he was to go. But before we dive straight in, we need to make a note of what drives these few verses that we read in this passage. Matthew, the author, views each step of Jesus' way as fulfilment of Scripture. There's a, a numerous uh, references to the Old Testament here, and Matthew says three times, it's been fulfilled, it's been fulfilled, it's been fulfilled. 
And so this is comforting news for us, that our faith is not a novel or a new faith, it's just sort of sprung up when Jesus did. It's rather founded by God in the beginning of time. And all those shadows and types uh, in the Old Testament, some of them that we've seen in 1 Samuel, reach their climax, their zenith, their fulfilment in Christ, their clearest fulfilment in Christ. The New Testament reveals, as the saying goes, what the Old Testament concealed. Well, in the passage that Carl took last week, we saw that the Magi, or the the, the astrologers, those kings that have come, uh, were told by Herod to uh, go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And so Herod must have thought that he was very clever when he asked the Magi, you know, come back here guys and tell me where the Saviour is or where this baby is, because I want to worship Him too. And obviously, Herod had no intention of doing, uh, worshipping uh, the, the baby. He wanted to, obviously, murder this apparent challenger to his throne. Uh, this is often the problem with people in power. They are challenged by dangerous ideas, and much like Roger Williams, who had the dangerous idea that the civil magistrate shouldn't meddle in religious affairs, and he was sent away. And the birth of our Saviour not simply brought a dangerous idea, but a dangerous reality, uh, at least for rulers and kings, that Christ is Lord. The kings of the earth must submit to a higher authority. And it was this truth that had those early Christians martyred. They would not burn the incense to Caesar, acknowledging that Caesar was Lord. They would only submit to Christ as Lord. And Herod too was disturbed, disturbed by the thought that hey, now there is a challenger to my throne. Uh, Psalm 2 gives this incredible framework for us to understand not only Herod's actions, but the actions of all uh, people in power who would uh, disregard the authority of of, uh, our High King. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast, their, uh, cast away their cords from us. And sinful men and women and sinful rulers cannot stand the thought that there is a God who would challenge their personal sovereignty. We like to say that we are the kings and queens of our own worlds. And Herod was one of those kings who said just that, I am the king of my own world and I rule. The Magi had got the better of him. And he was furious, furious, and he sought to eliminate the child. Now, I should have said, have the kids got their um, colouring in sheets? There were some at the back. Good, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, Herod was one of those kings in rage, and the Magi had got the better of him. He was furious, and he sought to eliminate the child by murdering all the young males of the town of Bethlehem and the area. Uh, and of course, Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, speaks of the demise of such rulers. The, these rulers... Uh, there is the King, uh, Jesus, who will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. In fact, there's an interesting passage in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter uh, 12, uh, that I'd encourage you to read after the service, that symbolizes and fulfills both of Psalm chapter 2 and uh, Matthew chapter 2 as well. It presents to us symbolically, that is, it gives us a behind-the-scenes spiritual explanation of what is taking place physically uh, in this count before us. Uh, There's a woman who represents God's covenant people and and likely Mary as well and and this woman, we read, uh, gives birth to a male child, one who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And so I think the identity of that uh, child in Revelation chapter 12 is quite clear. He's the one who will rule with this rod of iron that's mentioned in Psalm chapter 2. This is the King the Messiah, the Christ. And we read in Revelation chapter 12 of a beastly figure, a dragon who is identified as Satan and who is motivating the earthly powers to uh, persecute, persecute and rail against God's chosen King. And at this point in time, it was Herod who was the physical representative of Satan's kingdom, who was here assailing Christ by killing the boys of Bethlehem and the area. And of course, this beastly dragon is ready to raise its ugly head in every generation to oppress the people of God. And the child escapes in uh, Revelation chapter 12, but her child was caught up to God and to His throne. 
Now, Revelation chapter 12, in true apocalyptic fashion, uh, that views the world's event from a heavenly perspective, looks far beyond Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus and his need to flee, and it also uh, accounts the resurrection, the ascension, and Christ's judgment. And the Gospels, of course, are here to tell us that not simply that a child has been born, but this child inaugurates, brings in God's reign, God's kingdom, and that this king will defeat all opposing kingdoms and do so on the cross, beginning, beginning that work on the cross, which, of course, uh, as, as he uh, uh, defeats those opposing kingdoms who are motivated by this beastly dragon that we hear of in Revelation chapter 12. Herod represents just one of these kingdoms who are being motivated by this beastly figure, that is Satan. But nonetheless, Herod presents a deadly threat. And so, Joseph receives direction from an angel in a dream. We read, Rise, this is the angel speaking, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Well, Herod actually had a long history of murdering anyone whom he suspected of being a challenger to his throne. He was an incredibly beastly figure. Uh, one of the commentators I read uh, notes that he murdered his favourite wife, Miriam. Uh, he had his two sons strangled and had another son executed for uh, promoting himself as the heir to the throne. So, uh, murder is all in a day's work for Herod. Uh, the murdering of these babies from Bethlehem uh, would have been the same, all in a day's work. And this is the heart of sinful men, isn't it? That the failure to see each individual as being created in, in the image of God, worthy of equal dignity and respect, leads to incredible atrocities. History, of course, is replete with corpses of men and women slain on the altar of powerful yet wicked men. Even last century, we know where there's millions of people who died under the likes of people like Joseph Stalin. Between 20 and 60 million died under his reign. That's a thousand or so on a good day. This is the work of the beastly dragon in this world. Uh, it happened under Herod and it continues to happen in every generation. And here the spiritual beast is represented at this moment in Matthew's Gospel, physically on earth by Herod. And so to the Lord, uh, to protect his son, the Lord as he protects his son, his chosen king and his earthly family, dispatches the angel. Uh, Jesus was and is the son of God in the flesh, able to bleed and die when he was on earth. And so this angel, in effect, says, you know, the beast in the form of Herod is coming for your child, Joseph. You've got to protect him. Uh, but at this point, the only thing you can do is run. You've got to flee to Egypt. And Joseph is obedient to this word. We read in verse 14 and 15 that he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed uh, to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. So they had to leave everything behind. I wonder if Joseph had a, uh, a carpenter's shop set up. I wonder if he was worried about he, how he would support his family, if there would be work in Egypt. Perhaps he was anxious about what was going to happen. But even more so, we see that Joseph was faithful. He obeyed the angel, he obeyed the word of the, the Lord from the angel and left in the dark of night. Uh, Egypt was probably about 400 kilometres away at uh, it had order, it was beyond Herod's jurisdiction and according to Philo, it had a large Jewish, pop Jewish population there as well. And now Matthew brings in one of those passages from the Old Testament to tell us that something has been fulfilled. Verse 15, they went to Egypt and Matthew says, this was to fulfill that the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now if you look at the footnotes in your Bible, you'll see that that passage is from Hosea chapter 1 verse 11 and when you turn there you'll see that the context there isn't primarily about the Messiah but about the deliverance of God's people, the Israelites and, and so what's the point? Uh, Matthew would have known that Hosea chapter 1 verse 11 was primarily about the nation of Israel, you know what's he trying to tell us about the Messiah? Well that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises of Israel, He is the promised seed of the woman, He is the suffering servant of Isaiah, Christ is the true Israel. Uh, James Boyce says it like this, uh, what Matthew understood and wants us to understand as well is that Jesus is the ultimate embodiment of Israel, 
the one in whom is wrapped up all the character and destiny, and you could say also the stories of the people of Israel as well. The fact that Jesus was taken to Egypt and returned from Egypt was one of the God's ways of alerting us to how significant Christ's tie with His people really is. And so by going to Egypt, Jesus is physically retracing the, the story and the steps of the Israelites so that it can be said of Him, Jesus is the true and the greater Israel, except that His story is one of success and not failure. The people of Israel failed over and over again, but this uh, Jesus, as He recounts and retraces the steps of the people of Israel, He succeeds. Well, the next event in the story is that Herod does in fact kill all the male children in Bethlehem and around the, the area. In, fact, in, in verse 16, we read that Herod becomes furious, much like that uh, dragon in Revelation chapter 12, furious that he'd been tricked by the Magi. And so in verse 16, we read, Herod sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under. Herod's hope that in this dragnet of death, God's chosen king would be killed as well. Now, you might, uh, your mind might tick back again to another story in the Old Testament, uh, and one that Matthew doesn't explicitly mention, but of course is there. We can see it. Um, we know that as the identity of Israel was forming uh, in Egypt, there too was another beastly figure, a ruler that opposed uh, God's people because they were getting too uh, big, there were too, too many Israelites in Egypt, that was Pharaoh. And he too tried to destroy the people of Israel, and what did he do? He did the same thing, he ordered that all the boys would be executed, and we read of one baby boy that was born, who was placed in a basket and floated down a river, only to be saved by Pharaoh's uh, daughter, and to be taken into the palace, and to be raised as a prince. And again, we see indirectly that Jesus is the counterpart to Moses here. Jesus is reliving all of those stories of the Israelites. And one key difference is, of course, is that Moses would hear the voice uh, as, he, as he's standing before that burning bush. Moses would hear the name of the Lord, I am who I am. But when Jesus would live, and we read this in John chapter 8, Jesus wouldn't simply hear the name of the Lord, He would take that name uh, uh, on himself. He would say, truly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. But Matthew doesn't choose this story of uh, the babies being executed in Exodus uh, as the fulfillment passage. Uh, he rather refers to Jeremiah chapter 31. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they, they are no more. Now, if, again, if we check Jeremiah, the context there is not weeping and mourning for the babies killed by Pharaoh's daughter in, uh, in, in Egypt, but rather it's Rachel weeping for her children who would die in exile. But Jeremiah, though full of pain, is full of hope. Like the Israelites, we are strangers in a strange land. There is hope. The prophet in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 declares in the same chapter, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. And then at the end of chapter 31, there is the promise of Jeremiah of a new covenant. And the point is that there was hope for the exiles in Babylon. They would return to their own land. And even in the midst of this ghastly atrocity that occurred in Bethlehem, and the ghastly atrocities that we see here, Rachel weeping for, there is hope. Now, Bethlehem being a small town and probably the area as well, would mean that there might have only been a handful, tens and twenties and thirties of young uh, male boys uh, executed, but she would be enraged. We should be enraged, sorry, even at the murder of one child. There is hope for Israel, there is hope for you, there is hope for me, because in God's providence, the Messiah escaped the clutches of this beastly figure that is Herod. We can have hope, even through suffering, because it's the Lord that directs my story and your story for our good. Because we have a King who will restore you, who will lead us out of exile. Well, the third event that Matthew records for us is the return of Joseph's family with, uh, Joseph with his family. Uh, and this too is instigated by another angel. But when Herod died, 
Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who saw the child's life are dead. And so presumably, Joseph considered returning to perhaps to Bethlehem or where he'd previously come from in the south somewhere, back to his carpenter's workshop. But Joseph had concerns. Although Herod was dead, Archelaus, one of his sons, had taken power in the south, in Judah, and he thought, will I be safe with my family down this, in the south, southern area? After Herod's death, the Romans recognised that none of Herod's sons had the capacity to rule over Palestine with, this, with the same ferocity and ability as Herod. Uh, and so they divided it up with Archelaus being given the south. And this son, like father, like son, uh, he inherited the same violent character as his father. And so Joseph was afraid to live in Judea. And so we read, he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. So J Joseph kept walking as he travelled into, back into Israel, he kept walking past the south and into the north, away from Archelaus. And many Christians throughout the ages have relocated, haven't they, in order to escape tyranny. And Joseph is doing just that. Where can I keep my family safe? Well, in the north of Israel. And now Matthew introduces his last Old Testament reference. He lived, he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now this reference is a little bit more tricky because a specific Old Testament to say that Jesus was a Nazarene doesn't exist word for word uh, with what Matthew was saying. And so how should we understand it? Well, Matthew says himself that he's referring not to a singular prophet, but to the prophets. So it seems that he's intentionally alluding not to a singular quote in the Old Testament, but a larger idea from multiple prophets that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. And how does th that larger idea come together? Well, Nazar Nazareth was a backwater town of little consequence. It's never mentioned in the Old Testament or early Jewish records. If Jesus uh, was known as Jesus of Bethlehem, he would have had that aura of the king who came from the royal city uh, where, where David was brought up in. Jesus of Bethlehem would have been majestic. Jesus of Nazareth, on the other hand, had this aura of mockery and of, of little consequence. Who is this guy? Who, where's Nazareth? Is there nobody from nowhere? And this reminds us of the constant Old Testament overtones uh, that the Messiah would be despised and rejected from passages like Isaiah 53 that speaks of the despised uh, and disfigured uh, suffering servant well, we've seen three events, the flight to Egypt, the slaughter of the children, and the journey uh, to Nazareth. And there's at least two great themes here. The sovereignty, sovereignty of God, of course, over beastly and earthly powers like Herod and his uh, protection over his son, and that you need to confess Jesus as your King and Saviour. Consider again Psalm chapter 2. Uh, the psalm sheds light on this chapter from Matthew. Psalm 2 described how the nations of this world would conspire and rise up and take their stand against their, the, the Lord and His chosen King. And this is what, exactly what Herod did. Motivated by his allegiance to the evil one and by being part of that spiritual kingdom of Babylon, in fact, this is what everyone does apart from uh, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that transplants us from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Babylon, to the kingdom of light. Apart from Christ, we will all say with Herod, uh, the, two, the, 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 the true king will never rule over us. We will rule ourselves and rail against God's chosen king. This is the heart of every man apart from Christ and every woman as well. But the Lord is never troubled by our cosmic rebellion. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 4, we read, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, that is, scoffs at them. And this is the only place in the Bible where we see that the Lord is said to laugh. And it's not a pleasant laugh, is it? It's a scornful, mocking uh, laugh at those who would rebel against Him, in the sense of communicating to them who are oppose uh, our God. You know, who do you think you are to oppose me? 
to those rebellious subjects like Herod and, and people in this day as well, the Lord says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And the nations belong to God's chosen king, that is Christ, and he will rule over them with a rod of iron. And what are we to do when we come face to face with God's chosen king? Even as we speak today, we, we, uh, we can't see Jesus with us today, but we have his word and, and we are presented, Jesus is presented to us in, in his word. We come face to face with Jesus in his word. Psalm chapter 2, verse 10 would tell us to be wise and be warned. Uh, we are to serve the Lord with fear and to rejoice and to rejoice with trembling and above all, we're to kiss the Son in loving submission. Why do we submit? Well, because unlike Herod, unlike, unlike those who live uh, uh, and make themselves their own kings, we read that uh, blessed, at the last verse there, blessed are all those who take refuge in Him. Uh, Herod refused to take refuge. The, ki the king was there on earth with, with him and he wanted to kill the king, not take refuge. This is what the world around us refuses to do, to take refuge in God's chosen king. More than rescue from physical illness, we need rescue and refuge from our sin and the judgment that follows. We need refuge in Christ to protect us from that greater judgment. This world and the rulers of this world will rage and continue to rage, but why should you? Why should you take refuge in Christ? Well, the hands He holds forth for you to kiss are the hands pierced by nails when He was crucified for you, uh, uh, when He crucified, was crucified in your place. And he will return to judge the living and the dead, the dead. This is the power of the king. He has overcome those whose power, who took their power to overcome Jesus, to kill Jesus while he was on earth. And he overcame that death so as to bring life to his people. And you can come under his protection as well. Verse 12 we read, Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For the glory of God. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you that you protected your son from both the physical and the spiritual beasts in this world so that he could fulfill his mission on the cross. We thank you that Christ has become the true Israel, the embodiment, the fulfillment of the story of Israel, all the symbols and the promises of the people of the old covenant people he has fulfilled. We thank you that he succeeded where everyone else had failed and that you have installed uh, Jesus as your chosen king. The rulers who rule with a rod of iron, he is the ruler who rules with a rod of iron and has possession of all the earth. We thank you that we can take refuge in him. We thank you for the hands that were crucified that it now extends to us and receive us as family. Father, we pray for our community. We ask that many would call out to you over this Christmas period. We pray that we and other faithful churches would be faithful in our witness and service so that we might be salt and light to our community. We pray for our families who are on holidays, keep them safe, we pray on the roads, and even more so that over these holidays, we, you would help us persevere in faith. We ask that you would be with, uh, very close to our church family who may be sick or distressed or depressed. Please provide them with peace that surpasses understanding and help us live godly and obedient lives for your sake, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Just a reminder too that um, this Saturday is Christmas Day, so we'll have our church service here at nine o'clock for the church service. Oh, okay, ten, so sleep in. Okay, sleep in. Okay, so ten o'clock. I'm glad you told me, otherwise I'd be turning up at nine and wondering where everyone was. But um, yeah, join us for our Christmas um, service and then lunch afterwards if you want to join in that as well. Let's stand and sing our final song. Oh, 
stay for a cup of tea and coffee. Thanks. <laughs>